darkness, one of the many things that one must endure in the aftermath of a Category 4 hurricane. And yet the people of Southwest Louisiana found a way not only to endure the darkness of one catastrophic event, but four. And by the time you finish watching this documentary, Southwest Louisiana will have gone over 365 days without supplemental disaster relief funds from our U.S. government. Love is the one game that cannot be called on the account of darkness. Sometimes a moment is hard to visualize, let alone describe. And an event, it can be even harder. But on the simplest level, it can always be defined as a feeling. And me, personally, I feel that my hometown was hit by something so catastrophic that no film could do it justice. And this is a feeling that at some point has overwhelmed us all. But some amongst us, unfortunately, are feeling it now more than ever. And sometimes it feels like an urge, an urge that makes you want to give up and quit. And other times it's like a desire a desire to just throw in the towel. But as weak as you may feel sometimes, and as tired as you may all be, on this day, it's not just about the devastation you'll see, but it's about the strength of a community. You are stronger than you've ever been before. It'll just take time to see it. And though you may feel forgotten, there's one thing, there's one thing we'll always have. And that's each other. And who knew? Who knew I could be so strong? Who knew? Underneath the weight of it all, when I fall apart, when I come undone, it's just the prelude to the beauty yet to You know the funny thing about a hurricane? You never know how powerful one is going to be until it hits your hometown. But that's where the humor ends. Hours away that Laura has to offer you.
every mountain is your burden Not every climb has a fall at the end And no, my trails have brought me here I'm coming up Laura making landfall in Louisiana as a Category 4 the people of southwestern Louisiana have... In Louisiana, Hurricane Laura roared Laura ashore. Made landfall. We're going to take a look at the destruction. Um, you know, a lot of things to cover. Um, it's very dangerous out here. Uh, you know, we're all hot. We're all sweaty. We all want to shower. We, we don't have the services that we normally have uh, in our community. And so people need to be patient. We have some serious, serious catastrophic damage that took place because of this storm. We have very dangerous road conditions um, that are not safe. So when we talk about curfew, there is no negotiation with that. At 7 p.m. at night, policemen are going to stop you and ask you what you're doing and why you're out. And you better have a damn good reason. I know everybody wants their air conditioner back on. Uh, I want to take a bath so bad and shave. And, you know, we just don't have the luxuries that we have right now. So relax, take a deep breath and know that we're all on the same page uh, and we're going to try to fix these problems for you. The response to Hurricane Laura in towns like Lake Charles and Cameron, Louisiana, is a special window into American life. An area where risk is central to the theme. But even by our standards, Hurricane Laura was inconceivable. Laura was just the beginning of a series of cataclysms that followed in its wake. Because the list of things that can still go wrong after a storm like this are endless. Medical facilities are affected. Food provisions disrupted. Important things drop from the radar. Everything that was regular is now suspended. The risk curve starts sloping up, not down, as the potential for people being killed needlessly goes up dramatically. It's a spellbinding paralysis of a force stronger than ourselves. Measuring for a storm isn't like measuring for drapes, because after, you still have to clear up the unholy, world historic mess. The community has spent the better part of the previous week imagining the havoc after the storm. But how do you respond when your own home has been scattered to the four winds? With outages around the city causing communication to go dark, actors Taja V. Simpson and Lodger Collins decided to use their platform and celebrity to bring awareness to the situation. For those of you who don't know, Hurricane Laura completely destroyed our great and wonderful city. Look, I know you've seen the news and photos, but trust me when I tell you that none of this compares to the actual damage that Laura's wreaked. To drive around the city and see the devastation 
that still exist, of course, made me sad. Evacuees are now returning home to face extreme circumstances, unlivable homes with severe water damage, mold, and toxins. This is the place I grew up, where I went to junior high, high school, college. This is the place where has made me who I am. It's gonna take some years for Lake Charles to recover. Southwest Louisiana had now gone almost a month without supplemental disaster relief from the U.S. government. Hi, everybody. This is Mayor Nick Hunter, mayor of the city of Lake Charles. One of so many people from around the country right now that are helping us here in Lake Charles. So I don't want what I'm about to say to diminish that, that the national media is just not covering what's going on here in Lake Charles. The need is real. The pain is real. They're not talking to me, the mayor, but obviously they're talking with someone in Lake Charles about what's going on. I talked to my uncle in Florida and he said, no, Nick, there's you weren't on the news and nobody was on the news from Lake Charles. Even though the national media won't cover it, um, the struggle and the pain of what a lot of locals are going through is very real to them. The Louisiana Department of Health reported that more than 220,000 people were without water and might not have services for weeks or months. At least 20 million people were in the hurricane's path, and more than half a million people were ordered to evacuate. The Texas cities of Beaumont, Galveston, Port Arthur, and Louisiana's Cameron and Calcasieu parishes were among the area's mandatory evacuation orders. Hundreds of thousands remained without power as cleanup efforts continue. And in Louisiana, where the COVID-19 infection rate is higher than in Florida, Arizona, and New York, State shelters remain closed. In areas like New Orleans, officials prepare to shelter up to 40,000 people who can't afford hotel rooms, don't have vehicles, or have disabilities that make evacuations more difficult. So when people began to return home, like Noir Fairley, the difficulties had just begun. It's like nice building, and it looked like it was just ripped apart like picture sticks. And just to know, I was just in there two years ago honoring my kids going to graduation and now it's just nothing. Rubble. You think you can understand the storm, but when Laura dissipated, everyone sighed together. The single most glaring fact about the landscape was the absence of an upside. Southwest Louisiana was on the wrong side of being famous. Still got blue tarps on a lot of the houses. It's not that they didn't necessarily have insurance, it's just some insurance providers. Uh, it's not coming through as fast. You see people have opportunities to build homes because there's just no homes for people to stay in. Their houses are gone. So they, they can't even come back to anything because there's, there's no place to rent. Apartments are torn down, destroyed. It was a jarring sight to see. Most of the buildings would never be able to get back on their feet. Relentless destruction. An example of the transience of human life. The whole landscape flattened. Desolate, urgent, storms, storms like this are not tests. You can't study for them. So when you got people that want to come home, what are they to do if there's nowhere to live? And what's, what's the sad part of some of these homes, the insurance company has basically said that well, it's still habitable. Like, man, you got a whole half side of the roof. Why they stay on the other side? Really? Come on. Now. This is the, the temporary location for the site to where they're doing all the building. And they have moved it because it was more than that. So they have moved some of it. 
a lot of people were upset about it, but once again, you know, we want to get it out the street so the cars can drive the utility vehicles. It's got to go somewhere. So they were able to get this, which, you know, I feel uh, for a temporary situation, it was a good idea. Around 8,000 homes were possibly destroyed in two states, according to the Red Cross. Nick Hunter, the mayor of the hardest hit area, Lake Charles, said it was unclear when electricity and water supplies will be restored. It's going to be a long time. Well, I say that. It looks like it's going to be a long time, but we coming back. It's just, it's just rough to see it like this. Of Hurricane Laura giving you an idea of what winds of at least 130 miles an hour can do. This As we drove in further east on Martin Luther King Highway, we saw uh, this. That is the case here, as you see, just rows and rows and blocks and blocks of homes in Lake Charles. And remarkably, 18 years, she said it was by the grace of God that this church is still standing because it was quite frightening riding out the storm. What is it like? To lose a home, you build from your dreams. A house lifted as one with the earth beneath it and dropped six inches to the left. A wind that flails metal cars and yet leaves small parts of a town eerily undisturbed. A full-size SUV wrapped around a tree. This this is what it's like. It's the type of thing you have to see to believe. And yet, through the entire experience, many had grown a sense of unease that didn't stop when the storm blew out. If you ever wanted to know what the inside of your neighbor's house looked like, Now you knew. My house is collapsing. Literally collapsing. Delta accelerated it. But Laura, she shifted the foundation, the piers. She actually, the pressure of her wind, so it hits the peak, it has to come out, that force. It actually compacted the ground, pushed the ground. So essentially it didn't actually move the house, it moved the ground. Nothing around here looks the same. Like literally not a square inch it looks like it used to be. To it. I made money off this house, and so I put all of my blood, sweat, and tears into it. I put all my money into it. You know, I, I updated it, remodeled it. I was working on getting it, um, recall it for the historic preservation. I was applying for that because it has historic value. I don't know if it still does, but it did. So literally, the only thing that could have burst the bubble in Lake Charles and made me lose my investment happened. The literal only thing that could have changed our growth and our GDP and the real estate appreciation happened. And it happened twice. I've already done EMDR once for storm-related trauma. <laughs> that was one session. I need more, unfortunately. It's crazy how deep these things go. Like, I just wanted to cry and go with it. I didn't have any motivation, but I had three days to clean up, get this house ready, get the inside of my house ready, and get out. Because once you walk out that door, you know it's never gonna be the same but I didn't have a choice. I couldn't go to bed. I couldn't do anything except <laughs> just 
power through it. I wouldn't even call it that. It was just desperation on this. And so FEMA, in all of this, has been my angels. They've been my heroes. They've been the MVP around here. Because when I needed help the most, somehow they were always there to pick me up and give me what I needed. that <laughs> my insurance company. They're not um, honoring my service that I pay for. They haven't been there for me at all. And if I can't do business with you that I'm paying for a service, and you're just ignoring me and denying. They came in, both adjusters for Aurora and Delta basically said, you need a structural engineer. I'm not qualified to do that, yada, yada, yada. The, they sent the report to the insurance company, the reports come back, and probably 90% of what they told them was cut out. I can't tell you the depth of my anger right now. I'm holding it in. <laughs> it's so upsetting. Why does it have to be like that? There's so many churches, uh, amazing uh, centers of faith in our community that have been affected. For those who still don't think that we uh, we were hit too hard in Lake Charles, I want you to take a look at this. So this is um, this is what's left of the gym behind me, and as you can see, uh, it's pretty much completely destroyed. So this is a very important uh, part of our community right here. And uh, like I said, there's dozens of churches around town that are going through the same thing. For those people who still think that uh, we weren't hit that hard, just take a look at some of these images. And I challenge you to feel the same way after you uh, see some of what we're going through. It doesn't take you being in the direct path of a category four hurricane to know that. If there's one agency you want ready and prepared in your city for an extreme situation, it's the Homeland Security and Emergency Prepared Agency. It was obvious that Laura was going to be a big hurricane. And at the point that it was getting up to category two or three, uh, we, you know, started getting concerned about it. So we, we were developing our information, what we're going to say. And about four days out, it's obvious it's probably going to go to a Category 4 hurricane. The OHSCP maintains and operates the Emergency Operations Center. The center is used by officials during emergency situations, making the OHSCP the central coordinating agency for all outside assistance in emergency situations, including FEMA. Yeah, one thing that we noticed was the forecast track. Hurricane Laura was hitting each point on the forecast track. It's very unusual for a forecast and an actual track to line up. And that was worrisome because if it, we knew if it continued on the forecast track, we were going to be right in the bullseye for that uh, hurricane. Our worst case scenario here is just about like Hurricane Laura, where it, the hurricane makes landfall uh, west of the uh, Kakashi Ship Channel. That causes our greatest storm surge on the on the east side of the of the hurricane. If you live in the listed areas and have not done so, evacuate now. They were predicting a 19-foot storm surge. Now we got, <clears throat> for example, Hurricane Rita. We got about a little over 10 feet. So we're talking about over the top of a house more than what we got for Hurricane Rita, which was a tremendous storm surge. Follow the most designated evacuation route set up by your local authorities. If you're in 150 mile an hour winds like we had, had we had a lot of people who stayed, we would have had many injuries and maybe possibly even some deaths because we had a lot of trees crash through houses and roofs come off and things like that. This hurricane will be extremely dangerous for if, if you do not leave, you will face certain death. 
nowadays we have so many different ways to convey information. What it told me was when we when we made the final call for a mandatory evacuation, I think most people already had made their mind up. They were just waiting on us to uh, say the word. But our job is to convince people, hey, the impact of this is going to be bad enough. You don't really need to be here. So we had a tremendous, uh, I think, a tremendous response to the evacuation. We had no no direct fatalities from Hurricane Laura, which is nothing short of amazing. Amazing or lucky, that will be left up for future generations to decide. Nonetheless, no direct fatalities does not mean no fatalities at all. For those who had experienced Hurricane Rita, the memory of getting back into a city after a hurricane was quite vivid. So the decision to stay or evacuate became the question everyone was asking. For some, the thought of waiting and wondering if they were returning to something or nothing at all was all too much to bear. So Lake Charles Toyota, an unlikely place, became a shelter for employees and some of those who did decide to stay. Did he park it in the shop? He put it up on a lift so that if we get if we get water, it, we can get, a, let's go see how many feet of water we can get. The week or so before, we knew what was coming and we didn't know how serious it was going to be, but we knew we needed to take it seriously, so we did. Uh, but we knew from the get-go, for as soon as we started realizing there was a hurricane in the Gulf, they weren't going to leave. I got to make a documentary. The calm before the storm can be an uncomfortable place. You continually question if you made the right decisions. If you stay, the question becomes about your safety and whether or not you have enough supplies to see it through. And if you leave, it becomes about the things and the people you left behind. We had about, I want to say it was like 31 people here. It was, it was, it was eight or 10 families. I think it was about 30 or 31 people, uh, including five or six toddlers and a few teenagers and uh, nine animals. As Hurricane Laura made its approach towards the shores of southwest Louisiana, winds began to intensify, followed by the rain. If there was anything that needed to be done outdoors, it needed to be done now. We were, we were perfectly fine and comfortable all the way through the night till 10 or 11 o'clock. Once it got to be after midnight, 12 to one o'clock is when I think it got really bad. And that's when we, at that point we, pulled everybody away from the glass, from the glass windows in the front, and we had assigned watches, uh, the, 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 the family, the heads of family, the men in the, in the, in the uh, stayed here with us all kind of had a watch for the night. And so that person, it, at 12 or one o'clock, we assigned that person to say, don't let anybody get close to this glass out front. And then uh, within an hour or so of that, we moved everybody back to another layer of glass into the very, into the core of the building where there's no windows. Thankful to see morning light is a saying that many of elders have said. But that morning light would yet reveal many reasons to be thankful. We stayed up, there was two or three of us that stayed up the whole entire night just to make sure, like I said, we had we had watches, but some of us some of us stayed up the whole time. But it, we really didn't couldn't tell how bad it was um, until about five or six o'clock in the morning when the sun started coming up because around one, Sometime between midnight and one, all the power went out down the street. Um, transformers exploding and all that, and it was eventually pitch black. Yeah, you just can't really see anything. And once it was black, you couldn't see what was going on around you. And I mean, you could hear the wind and see the rain up close, but you couldn't tell 
really how, how bad it was, how much stuff was blowing around, how much stuff was falling down. Um, we could hear, you know, we could hear that, that parts of the building were being torn away on the outside because of the way it was, the wind was blowing through the attic. What we, once we realized that the wind was blowing across our heads through the attic, we knew that the north side of the building had taken serious damage, the south side of the building had taken serious damage. But once the sun came up and we were able to you know, get out and move around, we got a, in a four-wheel drive truck and went out through the grass and found our way to a road and eventually found our way to the interstate. Well, behind me, you can see just piles and piles of debris. And behind those piles of debris, you see homes covered in blue tarps. The color blue has always been synonymous in Lake Charles with more than just his hue. What's hard to grasp after a hurricane is that you think of a house as being safe. When after a hurricane, so many become dangerous places. It's the trauma after the storm that gets you. 
not the storm itself. And of course, there's the age-old problem of thinking that the storm won't affect you until it does. It's a false confidence and inner miscalculation leading to the sense of doom that turns all of our thinking upside down. The color blue, now a reminder of destruction's past, but it takes on a whole new dimension from a bird's eye view. Football field links of debris where houses once stood. The volatility of the moment. A thriving community reduced to atoms. Ghost house on top of ghost house. Waiting to be rebuilt. This message is going out to anyone that's displaced from the city of Lake Charles. Should you be in Baton Rouge, New Orleans, Texas, or anywhere in America. I want you to know that the city of Lake Charles is working very hard. We're working to pick up the pieces and put this city back together for you. And I know that you're going to be a part of that effort as well. Months had now passed and still no signs of supplemental. Serving the right to object, uh, we have now crossed $28 trillion in debt. 78,000 people called Lake Charles home. Oh. It's sad. In the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, the Road Home Program provided over $9 billion. With the deficit last year is over $3 trillion. The deficit this year will be over $3 trillion. There's a trillion dollar wish list out there for everybody. The Restore Program to date has provided over 650 million dollars. We all know what Lake Charles has gone through over the last year. We have zero. Nothing, nada, zilch. So I object to this because we're 28 trillion dollars in debt. We don't have any money and we should be fiscally conservative as we profess to be. Here's the real question. If we can find billions of dollars to build things such as walls, then why can't we find the money needed to help sustain the lives of the people we protect within them. Uh, this is actually my third hurricane uh, that I've actually, since I've been an agent, third major hurricane. I've had Rita, I've had Ike, and I've had, since this time, Laura, and I guess you can call Delta, make it the fourth one. 
you know, people were, they didn't really know where to turn. There wasn't any electricity. Most of the people were gone and the ones that were still here, it was like they were shell shot. Working through it, I wanted to come back here because I have a lot of people that are insured in this area. And, you know, I have a responsibility to my, really to my policyholders to try to at least be able to provide information. Imagine not only fighting a hurricane, but your insurance company too. A lot of people found out that they didn't understand their policies. They found that they were either underinsured or had a high deductible they could not afford. They just wanted to hear somebody's voice. Right. That was the main thing. They wanted to know that uh, uh, my insurance and what should I do, how should I go about doing it, and when can they come out and look at the damages. So what I wanted to do was to kind of educate them on the front end and let them know Understand that every house in this city was damaged. So we went out of electricity for what? Three and a half weeks, almost a month here before we got electricity. And because those houses were damaged, we were looking at having people to come in here to assess the damages. And those people that came in, they had nowhere to go. And they didn't come in immediately. Granted, you still gonna have some folks that wanted everything instantly. And right. in this particular case, it just didn't happen that way. Right. You know, so people became frustrated. And I, I really believe that the, the ones that got really frustrated is when they tried to call the agents' offices. And there was nobody there. What did you feel was the breakdown um, in between the policyholders and the insurance companies? Was it, uh, was it miscommunication? It was, was it the education level of it, it was you know, both. no it was, understanding of the actual policy? Yeah, and people didn't know their policies. And, right. and that's, it's, it's gonna serve as a lesson moving forward. A lot of people are living paycheck to paycheck in this community. And that was before the hurricane. So with regards to how, you know, we just gotta get them back. And when they come back, we gotta make sure that they have opportunities in this community to be able to enjoy a quality of life that is reflected of this area. And if an event of another storm should come, they, they and should be, and we all should be better prepared because it caught everybody off guard. Off guard. Home sweet home. And it had some little angel, uh, so if you were tall, you got to hit them and everybody would duck and then say, no, you're not gonna get hurt. It just, tells you you're too tall for my house. <laughs> this is the pod I had to get to put my furnishings in. And here it all is, or what could fit in here. It still is not big enough to put my stuff, but whatever we could save and whatever we could fit, we got it. The rest is in the house. When the hurricane hit, See how it made a hole, a round hole over there? And then all the uh, water came through the ceiling. So all this still has to be done. And if there was another one here, right up here, and in the bathroom, that's where I, the water damage I got from the storm was in one, two, three, four rooms. I don't. I didn't see any new uh, watermarks from Rita when Rita hit. Home. What defines home? Is it truly where your heart resides? Or is it where you have seen generations upon generations of your family grow? Where memories were born, but never die? Well, I want to stay in Lake Charles. So I know God's going to make a you know, way for me to sell my house and, you know, be able to get something that's going to meet my needs. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily my wants, but my needs. <gasps> Poverty comes in many flavors, but when it's forced upon you by climate, that's a bitter new taste. You're reminded how geography determines your opportunities, and yet the community stays and remains unmoved. 
So I was here from start to finish to now. <laughs> wow. I was so, here the day before when the sun was shining. Then the night came through. That's when she done up. That's when she came on through and let you know I'm coming. Blowing so hard, you can hear people. You can almost hear voices screaming in the wind, bro. Yeah, it, it was it was strong. I'll tell you something, we could see some change from one thing overnight, bro. Just mm -hmm. Right overnight, it was unbelievable. I just couldn't believe it. Stuff that I've been seeing all my life is damaged. It's, it's gone. Off the arm repair and had to be torn down. And, uh, the moon. So, how many houses do you think you've torn down or demoed since you've been here? Since, since the storm? Oh, uh, I'm about 15. We're out here serving the SWLA today because uh, it's, t it's just time.
understand just how much is at stake for a community by not building back their lives. Getting back to a place you once were, it sometimes involves giving back more than what was taken from you. What Hurricane Laurel took may seem like something that cannot be replaced, a feeling, a way of life that used to be so understood and so ingrained in our being that it almost felt tangible. A way of life that if you ever came here and experienced it for yourself, you would understand the richness of our culture. From streets filled with Mardi Gras celebrations to boils and backyards around the city during crawfish season, our way of life is unique and it cannot be washed away with rain are blown away with 150 mile an hour winds. Who we are is not in these bricks of these buildings, but it is in the soil on which we stand. We can run from the water, but you can't run from the wind. The days immediately after a storm feel almost mythical. It's a time when dreams, enthusiasms, yearning for change, longing to build a better world, all but disappear. Well, I was born and raised, actually I'm from Ranch and Area, which is about 12 miles to the east. And then my wife right here, we all went to college, all went to South Cameron together. And uh, she was raised here right there at the Red Line Creole. Hurricane Laurel will go down in history as the worst powerful storm to ever make landfall in southwest Louisiana. It happened just beneath us in the middle of the night in Cameron. Now the older I get, the tougher it is. Because I guess you can only get your butt whipped so many times and you finally say, man, I got enough. Mm -hmm. It's as if the storm had blown away your feelings along with your home. A nexus point where genuine possibilities clash head on with hard reality. You hope for change, but the storm has blown it all away. Oh, uh, what was 15, 13 years later, a big old Laura come through here and just wiped. Oof. Uh, we had about two foot of water. Less water, but more damage as far as uh, it knocked the doors out, windows out. Uh, Lost some uh, more roof and stuff for, for Laura. Rita, we only lost a small portion. Our house upstairs, we could have slept in it whenever we came back from, from uh, But uh, y'all come on in, this is our house. Um, this used to be our kitchen, our living room where our kids are playing, they were babies. And you can see the actual water line over here. We still got some cleaning to do. And we have a home left here, we have a house left. Most people don't, don't even have a home left. We have homes all up and down the coast here. And between Rita and I, and now Laura and Delta, ain't much left. We got a whole culture, a way of life that's pretty much gone. I mean, it's gonna be gone if we don't, some of us don't keep coming back. Uh, there's a lot of damage around here, but look at this right here. Uh, in, and I saw Cameron, and, and I will tell you that had individuals stayed, there's a very good chance that they would have been added so to that one of our list. Stayed. They heard the warnings, unsurvivable it was called, and for the most part, they got out with their lives. What do you think keeps bringing people back? It's home, man. In 1957, Cameron nearly was destroyed by Hurricane Audrey. Nearly 50 years later, Hurricane Rita. In 2008, Hurricane Ike. And now, Laura. We really had some beautiful homes at one time. All these trees were all beautiful. Uh, the land, I mean, people garden down here. Everybody locked in their gardens, kept their yards up. And then these are. And so we didn't even know that the homes were here. No, sir. You couldn't even. You know, I always wondered. I, I used to tell my wife, I said, boy, if this was before reading all that, I, said, I wonder what it looked like whenever the settlers first came here a long time ago, you know? But lo and behold, here comes these hair 
hurricanes, and you probably can can kind of get a glimpse of what it looked like when they when the when they first got the earliest settlers came out here and uh, and started trying to clear up land. Matter of fact, my mom said how they used to back in the day down here when they was kids. They used to form cotton and they had citrus citrus uh, those citrus forms, cotton forms, and before all modern transportation. The next thing you know, up in Lake Charles, and they started going to town and all that. You know, but this was all shell roads back in them days. Oh, uh, we used to have a lot of oil field work down here. I got a after reading, we built a, a storm, a born dominion storm house. Where our kids go to college and. We ever had to leave for a storm again, and we went all separated the last time for freedom. Me and my wife were at one place, my kids were all scattered out, going to college and different other people's homes. Now we have a place to go if we have to leave for a hurricane, like we depend on friends and family or a hotel. This is home. I mean, every time I every day I work down here, so every day I come down here, I do a little bit outside or inside. And that's what I tell Michelle. <laughs> Morning lights, heavy laughing in the street. I am in the town where my parents live. Familiar Sundays. I need this morning light to call my own. These few moments awake before I am breathing in water again. The real question is will the federal government provide the needed resources to our citizens who are struggling? That's what we are talking about when we're talking about supplemental disaster aid. We're talking about helping the people within the communities who need it the most. The hurricanes uh, that we experienced last year didn't just damage structures and tear down homes. They actually had major damages on schools and we had major issues across the board um, within our school district. You know, we had a lot of students, teachers that were displaced, uh, including myself. So one of the ones, um, it will be seven months in a couple of weeks and I'm still not in my home yet. You should know schools along the storm's path are canceling classes already as they anticipate storm damage and power outages tomorrow. So not only did our students miss um, their schooling on March 13th when the world closed down, but we actually didn't really officially get back in school until the end of October. So what I really love about the faculty, staff, and students here is really resilience. That we are Louisiana strong. That in spite of all of the difficulties that we've been through with people being displaced, teachers, <clears throat> teachers showed up every single day, no matter how far they had to drive. I still have a teacher that's driving in from Jennings and someone in from Beaumont because of housing and, and not being able to get back into their homes. Our children don't ask to be here, but once they are here, it is our responsibility, the parents and the community, to give them the world if we can. And that doesn't stop because of the hurricane. No, the nurturing and the education must continue even through the healing process. We had people who were dealing with grief, uh, lost several family members, and to get back to your school, and to see your school totally damaged, no internet, no phone, but yet the students are coming back. We had to totally transform the way we actually did education. And here in Capitol Parish, we, we've been able to uh, strive in the midst of all of this. Currently right now, we only have about a 6% failure rate with all of that going on. And that's directly attributed to the hard work uh, from, our, from our principals, um, the district staff, 
the teachers, and most importantly, the resiliency and resolve and intestinal fortitude of the students. We were one of the buildings that was really fortunate um, to not have damage. And I think that was really good for me, you know, to see my house devastated, to see so many of my faculty and staff members devastated. We had just worked so hard at doing some things in the building and renovating some things and changing things because this is my first year as the principal so that i think that was grace for me that in spite of what i lost in spite of what i went through i knew that the kids would be able to come back to school and so for that i was truly thankful that in spite of everything around that looked like this building was barely touched assist someone, uh, help someone, and don't be afraid to ask someone do they need help. Uh, more than likely, when you ask that the first time, uh, that answer will probably be a, um, a no, uh, because they're not accustomed to being vulnerable. But try to actually sit down and have a conversation with someone um, and find out, uh, because there are still people that are hurting and I need help. If you ever wanted a sign, that Lake Charles was turned into corner for the best, you had to look no further than the Rock Center and Cajun Navy. We've been on the ground since day one, since the disaster happened. Uh, a lot of help really in the emergency time, but uh, we're still on the ground till today. People were not prepared. Nobody was prepared anyways. And then of course when you have tarp and holes in your homes, no one even has winter clothes or you know extra blankets. So we did a, a drive, we got a lot of people donating things. And we delivered heaters and blankets to the people. Um, people, don't, people don't have extra money to go in a hotel. Maybe they don't have family. And so they'll try to stay in their car outside of their home while the insurance is taking time to fix it. I mean, so we try to bring attention to these things and find the people that are available to help and just get the people to the resources they need. That's what Cajun Day is really all about. So how y'all ladies doing? What y'all doing out here today? Um, we're helping give out boxes of food and milk to cars in the community. Okay. How long have y'all been out here today? Um, about uh, three hours. Yeah. yeah. I've been out here for about like four hours and then three. Have y'all done this before? I've been doing this around the city or just here? Um, just here, but we've done it multiple times. Yeah, like the hurricane, we was out here for almost like a month or two. Yes. We was giving out almost every day. But we was giving um, baby food, baby formula, diapers. We just did furniture, office yeah. supplies. We did um, cleaning supplies, a lot of different things that they needed for the hurricane. And what school do y'all go to? We go to college. Like college, 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 college. And I go to LeGrange High. Okay. Were y'all displaced during the storm? Yes, yes sir. For about three, two months. Oh, uh, for us probably a month or two. Yeah. Month or two, okay. And how old are y'all? I'm 17. I'm 15. I'm 14. What, what I've discovered in this time and what has given me hope is, and that is, this is something that I've never seen before, nothing that I've never uh, experienced in my life, nothing that I can say I was prepared for. But what I do know is that God is sovereign in this place. It's like, sort of like what you're doing, man. You, you know, you, you stand behind the scenes, you know where you want to go with the plot, where you want to go with the script, and that's who God is. He, he has a script, he has the plot, and though it's, it's has caught us off guard, it hadn't caught God off guard. And what we're seeing and experiencing now is a side of God that we that we wouldn't have experienced had we not gone through this tragedy. So while I, we don't wish tragedy and disaster on any other place, uh, but since we are here, we are trusting God in this season, and that's what I encourage all of us to do, trust God in this season, because what God can do is show himself in ways that you would have never seen him before had you not gone through that. So I thank God that I'm seeing another side of him uh, as we go through this crisis. This isn't the first time that these lands have gone through something catastrophic. They have seen the best of times and the worst of times. But if any resident of Lake Charles can tell you the story of strength, and how to be resilient in times like this, it's our oldest ones, the oak tree. And who knew, who knew I could be so strong, who knew, when I need the weight of it all, when I fall apart, when I come on and it's just the prelude.
pause for a moment to consider this. If you are ever hoping to preserve a certain worldview, there's no better place to start than within your own community. To care about something, something more than yourself. In a situation like this, you don't need people who have concerns about the bottom line or pleasing shareholders. You need fully invested community members to rebuild the most necessary of products, society. Uh, we're doing great, really. Um, uh, a lot of good things are happening, but and we usually have lots more produce here for the market, or we will have more produce this, this summer, but because of uh, our house being messed up, so we're rebuilding our house and different things. So instead of planting a garden this year, we're rebuilding house, so what we have here is honey today. Lake Charles is coming back. I can feel it in the air. Memorials are erected to commemorate those of who we have lost. Our stand is a reminder to what we have gone through. Often, you hear the words never forget, but if you went through it, how could you? One day in the not so distant future, when the evidence of Lake Charles' turbulent past will be hard to find, maybe, just maybe, a memorial will be erected to remind not only the future residents of this city, but the world of what a community can accomplish, even when it feels forgotten. I'm the only one that flies in this area, but I belong to three different kite clubs out of Sometimes the simplest thing, like flying a kite, can bring forth a sense of normalcy that everyone hopes to one day find. I lost my porch, but actually I didn't lose my roof. I have a metal roof, and I have, where my roofs came together, they have a caulking in there. Well, the storm broke the caulking loose, and it leaked there, but I re it, it's all good now. In the toughest of times, Sometimes you have to find a kite to fly. And if you ask Gary, these are the toughest of times. So you have to be willing to go anywhere the wind blows. What inspired you for this one? It's an auto grow. And see, the 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 tails, the they're called droves. And see they're spinning. Well, they kind of they kind of look like gesture hats, don't they? Yes. Yeah, that's what I thought too. <laughs> like I said before, this isn't just a story about the destruction caused by a storm. We had a bigger story to tell than that. It's about how when the chips are down, we fly higher and higher. To me, this says a lot about Lake Charles and resiliency. You know, you're not gonna let a storm stop you from flying kites. Two storms and an ice storm. Three storms. Trifecta.
No matter what you do, keep on moving. Sunshine comes, keep on moving. Rain comes, keep on moving. Trials come, keep on moving. Drama comes, good time comes, any kind of bull comes. That way, whenever the good times come and you're really good, and you. Well, um, we all went through the storm. Um, all of us who work here are from Southwest Louisiana. So this is our home and, and most of us had been through Rita and we thought that was the worst thing we'd ever have to, to go through. And this was so much worse. People here don't have the time to hire lobbyists to push their calls, but they were lucky enough to have companies like Thrive to help preserve the delicate architecture of their community. And they did it with the last tool in their toolkit a song. I think we, we, you know, tossing around ideas and everything, we kind of wanted to do the more upbeat, the more positive, but also wanted to do something different than a uh, standard video. So we thought, God, let's just make it a music video, you know, something that's just catchy, everybody's going to recognize it and sing it. And that also re represents you knowing that things are getting better. People like Christy Barber and the Thrive Team they're inspired by the golden luminance of their community. They believe in what they're doing. You can't put a price tag on that. Where people live, what they do and what they value, it all comes out in times like these. It's a simple emotional response. What can I do? We really wanted to give it kind of that feel, choir feel. The choir was a big thing because it's such a healing, you know, sound to hear that kind of sound. And kind of the main message we wanted to get it get across because we know this is how the people here are is but it was so bad it was hard to move from that point of this is terrible how do we come back from this of, how do we change this conversation from what happened to us to what can we make happen how do we turn this into an opportunity to make things better than they were before it may be hard for america as a whole to appreciate the source of its strength yet cities like lake charles cameron de ritter go a long way to giving you a direction as to where the strength may lie. Though Southwest Louisiana had taken a turn for the better, still hundreds of days had gone by with no supplemental disaster relief in sight from our U.S. government. I was up on this roof, we're actually on the roof of City Hall right now. September 7th, 2020, I remember I was pleading with people not to forget about what had happened here in Lake Charles with Hurricane Laura. Little did I know, that several weeks after that, we would be hit by another hurricane. And then several months after that, uh, once in a generation winter storm, and then a couple months after that, a 1,000 year flood event. So as I stand up here today, I acknowledge that a lot of progress has been made over the last year. But I also have got to acknowledge that there's still a lot left to be accomplished. You know, Lake Charles City Hall is going to be standing, it's standing today, and it's going to be here 10 years from now, 100 years from now. The real question is, within these communities, some of our, some of our most vulnerable neighbors, what's going to happen with them if we don't receive the proper federal response? Question. What got you through these times thus far? The overwhelming answer will be faith. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Or in other words, the assurance that what we hope for will come about, and the certainty that we cannot see it, 
but it still exists. Right now, Lake Charles may not be able to see the finish line as another season of storms approaches, but it's their collective faith that won't allow them to believe that one does not exist. once was destroyed, dilapidated, it will be rebuilt and it will be rebuilt even better. Never forget, you are stronger than you were before. It's just going to take time to see it. But let me tell you, I've seen it. I saw it every day. You reminded me why I call Lake Charles my home. Why no matter where I go, where else I live, you will always be in my heart. And though you may feel forgotten, please rest assured that you are not. And more help is on the way. I have faith that it is. The wind whistles like a freight train, leaving behind a trail of destruction and a lifetime of pain, ripping open the soul of Southwest Louisiana. From Lake Charles to Cameron to Jennings, even stretching to Alexandria. The heel of the boot ripped apart like a tree from the root. Down on the bayou in the parish of Calcasieu, a lone skyscraper riddled with shattered glass reflects fractured memories of years gone past. Crossing I-10 will never be the same again, all because of Laura and Delta and their deadly win leaving barely any rooftops left to stand on. Still, months later, screams of help echo in the dawn. A region painted blue with tarps is the new epidemic. Homes lost, jobs gone, amid a deadly pandemic. Mangled trees and rubble mingle where schools and businesses used to be. Familiar places, common spaces, now, foreign to me. Evacuation, devastation, frustration. This is still God's creation. The hill of Louisiana, forgotten by the masses. 
Now we're coming up from the ashes, swinging hard and fighting like Cassius, finding the courage to fly like a butterfly, even though it still stings like a bee. Rebuilding while shouting, there's still some fight left in me. And even though we know we may have to start all over again, we just keep going until the saints go marching in. Neighbors helping neighbors, proving what we knew all along. From Lake Charles to Cameron, all the way to Alexandria, we are Louisiana Strong. Take a moment, let the dust clear. Sing a song like your mama's there picking you even though you're hurting. Not every mountain is your burden. Not every climb has a fall at the end. And no, my trails have brought me here. I'm coming up from the ashes. I'm stronger than before. Coming up from the Sometimes people forget how powerful Laura really was. Laura was the fifth strongest hurricane to hit mainland U.S. in modern history, the fifth strongest, and the second strongest to hit the state of Louisiana in 150 years. We work together well here in southwest Louisiana. We have our differences. Sometimes we, we disagree on things, but let me tell you, we come together in times of crisis. National media was here 24, maybe 48 hours after Laura hit. After that, they all disappeared. In total, always lessons learned from events, but I am very proud of the local response and what we were able to do in the aftermath of what hit us. And it was a coordinated effort. It really was people working together. Uh, and I know that's cliche to say, but let me tell you, here in Lake Charles, when you're in the middle of a crisis, I don't care what your background is, what your political philosophy is, we don't ask those questions. We sit down at a table and we take care of people. And, and I really believe that's what we did in the afternoon. Uh, I'm the Mayor of Lake Charles. And, and I'm going to speak as the Mayor of Lake Charles and uh, not necessarily caring about any other aspect of, of politics or, or, or DC uh, dogma. Right. Other than I know that the people of this city need help. One of my greatest disappointments now is I see people more interested in polarization demonization of the other side, throwing stones at the other side, drawing a line in the sand, than they are about actually helping human beings here in Southwest Louisiana. Right. And that's a difficult thing to see. Right. Uh, I don't care whether you are a Democrat or Republican, there is suffering going on in this city. There are Americans who need help. And, uh, and quite frankly, I just do not see the bipartisanship and the human empathy mm -hmm. that we should be seeing right now. I'm prayerful and I am hopeful that at some point in the near future, people can get around the table and say, hey guys, you know that other stuff we're arguing about? It's important, but you know what's more important is the fact that there's American citizens in Lake Charles right now that need our help.